Oh yeah, there's a lot of ways to spook deer and ruin your hunt, sometimes before it even begins, every fall. And now with us getting into the heart of the season here, I think it's really important to know and to stay away from those factors that spook deer um, really predictably and definitively every single hunting season. And uh, we'll just jump right into it. I'll, I'll leave number one here. If you guys watch my channel a lot, you might guess what that might be at number one. But number five right here, you relying on a product of any kind, whether it's a scent, a spray, a contraption, whatever it is, a scent elimination box to actually control your scent. Meaning that if a deer's downwind of you, you think product XYZ is gonna keep your scent from getting in that deer's nostrils, especially in what we call those one sense deer where they just need one sense, whether it's their nose or sight or sound to actually spook them that being a mature buck you might fool a mature doe every once in a while you're going to fool fawns you're going to fool some young bucks a portion of the time but a mature buck you cannot fool now i certainly we love our limit shield we use that to spray down our boots spray down our legs because i believe the amount of scent that i leave on this board by touching it with my boot with a piece of clothing that's not a lot of scent at all i think you can eliminate that or you can reduce it to such a small degree the deer don't detect it or it's from so long ago they don't it doesn't bother them but when i have my scent of my person when i have perspiration heat coming out of my body when i'm breathing when i have scent behind my ears my ears coming out of my nose my mouth whatever it might be let alone bad stinky clothes you know can you ever cover your scent but when that's blowing at a deer i'm sunk i'm done so the ultimate form of scent control is actually making sure where you blow your scent on your stand location is not blowing towards deer. In fact, it seems like the older be I become, other than spraying down my legs, making sure I'm clean going in, my clothes are clean, I worry less about scent control because if my stand, Dylan and I are going out to a stand tonight, the, deer, the scent's blown out into an open field behind us. If deer are there, they shouldn't be there. Not to say they won't be there, but they probably won't be there. We're relying on the wind blowing in our face, looking where we think a buck might travel or cruise and blowing out to that field. We're doing that by defining where he moves and, and applying good uh, hunting strategy, which we'll talk about in the end. But bottom line is we're not relying on any contraption, any type of clothing, anything to control our scent because it's not going to work when it's blowing right at that deer. So once you get that out of your head, that'll really help you and keep you from spooking deer, a lot of deer. Because let's face it, most mature bucks that you spook, you'll never know that he was even there. He'll just turn, tuck tail, and get out of there. You'll see that with trail cameras. Maybe a neighbor saw a big buck running from a wood lot that you didn't even know was there. But it's because he smelled you and he took off and he won't even let you know he's there. He just leaves. He doesn't stomp around, look around, get downwind of you again, or look for sound, or try to spot you. He's just gone. Number four, noise. This is a huge one. How many hunts are ruined just getting into your stand in the morning? And that's so critical. You have a squeaky stand, you have squeaky gear, you have squeaky clothing. When you go back to draw a bow back, your arrow is not cushioned on the rest so that it doesn't make any noise when you're drawing back. You're just simply making noise. You haven't cleared the sticks and debris. I don't worry about leaves too much. You can just walk heel to toe slowly through there. Just crush it slowly going through. Stick breaking here and there, it's gonna alert a deer, but if you're not breaking a lot of sticks, but if you're slapping things against your clothes, your boot, you have noisy stands, you're going to spook deer. And you know, we might hear something, deer can't hear that better than us, I don't, that much better than us, I don't think. But if we can hear something 100 yards away and we can pick that up, a zipper, a Velcro strap, something unnatural, imagine how far a deer can hear. Maybe it's 200 yards, maybe it's 150. Bottom line is, they can hear it better than us at some point because they are living in the woods every day listening for sounds and things that might actually eventually kill them or equals some type of risk can i interject sure coughing and clearing your throat oh my gosh i film with a lot of people jeff doesn't do this but a lot of people you film with they're coughing and I mean, that's so unnatural for a deer to hear that it, very unnatural that's a good one really and so bringing candy uh, something like that. I mean, candy helps pass the time anyways, but I encourage you if they're loud wrappers to put them in a Ziploc bag or something. But I know Dylan, like there's times where I'll get a tickle in my throat and I, I have to cough. I'll probably look back at Dylan kind of like, oh my gosh, it just ruined our freaking hunt. You know, it's, it's kind of like, 
it's that and i've had hunts too where i make a noise pulling my bow up hit some metal and i i go to option stand b because i made a noise I expect deer might be 100 yards away, and whether it's coffin, clanging something, zippers, Velcro, um, I'm glad you brought that up, Dylan, about coughing, because I know there's a lot of people that cough. Um, <laughs> Paul, our friend that's here right now, he's hunting for 60, 65 years, and he likes hand muffs or something like that, because if he has to cough, he just muffles it with a, with a hand muff. He was telling us that last night. But I can guarantee a muffled cough is still bad if they can hear it. So maybe it muffles it from them here at 200 yards away. They'll still hear it at 75. But hard, hard to argue with an 81-year-old man that's had 65 years of deer hunting experience and killed a lot of bucks. So we'll just leave it at that. But number three, bad access. And what I mean by that is you're going through a food source in the morning to get to a bedding area. You're going through a bedding area in the afternoon to get to your stand location. You're going out through a food source in the afternoon, evening, after dark and spooking deer that are on there. You're basically not controlling your sight, your sound, your scent when you're accessing and departing your land and moving through your land like a predator. You know, I believe you can control your scent signature, meaning we're using the limit shield and we're spraying that on our clothing. We're keeping clean clothes. We keep mowed down paths where we can. We're keeping sticks from hitting us in the face or arms or brushing our hair against a scrape on the way in and out to leave scent that a, a big buck might detect. But really, sight, sound, so critical. Walking through deer, letting deer see you. We're planning our access and departure away from deer. We're making sure they can't see us, hear us, or smell us, and that's so critical. Even to the point when I get to a stand, I'm usually reaching up, grabbing for the third, fourth step, and starting to climb immediately. I don't wanna get dressed and leave a big saturation of scent pad right at the base of my scent or my stand that a buck can come by three hours later and smell it and know that I was there. You're just trying to be a predator when you actually go into the woods and that's so critical accessing departure and always keeping control of your scent, your sound and your, and your uh, sight, meaning that they can't see you, hear you or smell you. Number two, poor hunting strategy. This could apply to your on private land and you're designing your parcel and you're fitting things together that most of the time what I see, the more money someone spends on their land, the worse it gets. So a lot of people say, well, someone has private land, they spend $20,000, they're gonna shoot all the bucks. You know, be thankful if you're next to them on 20 acres and you're not doing anything because you're probably gonna take from them. And what I mean by that is, yeah, they might build a good buck herd, but when you build all those attractions on the property, whether they be water holes, mock scrapes, bedding areas, food sources, food plots, switchgrass, they attract deer, and if you don't manage the way you hunt that land, then you spook deer every time you step foot on the property because of all the attractions that have been built onto that with a lot of money and your neighbors take advantage of that. It's so different on public land. Public land, you don't have to do as much work other than scouting. I like public land. When I go to Michigan and Pennsylvania this year, it's almost relaxing. I go out, sit in my spots, I sit in funnels. I don't have to make food plots, bedding areas, worry about I'm hunting this stand this day. How does that affect next weekend's hunt? I'm not planning it. I told Dylan today, you know, it's right smack dab in the middle of the rut. I'm thinking through next Wednesday because it's supposed to have a lot of rain on Thursday. I'm getting my tires changed on Thursday. I'm planning ahead. So not only on my bad days, but my good days. And I'm looking at where I'm going to hunt Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Where I hunt Saturday affects Sunday. Sunday affects Monday. Public land is a lot different. We just go out and hunt. So it's a little bit different. The more attractions you put on the land, the more you have to hunt it effectively. But on public land, why are you hunting in a spot? Is it between food and bedding? Is it between bedding and bedding? Are you hunting more bedding here in the morning, more food source in the afternoon? What kind of stand location you are? Hunt with a purpose, hunt with a defined purpose. That's why on private land, nothing should be built or added or created on a land unless it has a purpose and it fits within a cohesive unit of movement. You expect bucks to bed here, does to bed here, them to feed here. Think about one thing. Think about the afternoon food source. Deer are traveling to this afternoon food source. It's a quality food source. It's the most quality food source in their area. It doesn't matter if it's public or private. Does will bed close to that. Bucks will bed further away and behind does from that. That's how you build your hunt. That's what you look at when you design a property in an effective way and then you build your access around that. Make sure you can access in the first place. You're not spooking deer if you're if you're hunting a food source here, you're not walking through it, you're not exposing yourself, that you have to walk through that location to get to a bedding area. Make sure you can move about your land as a predator. Make sure that you have a solid and defined hunting strategy. Make sure that you have that defined purpose of food to bedding movement, to food source to bedding movement, or bedding to bedding for cruising bucks during the daytime. Make sure you have a purpose. And number one, 
and this is critical. ATVs spook a lot of deer. I have a Polaris Ranger I love. I have my Kubota side-by-side. -side. I have a four-wheeler I use for spraying. I use ATVs year-round. I like them. We'll go access. We'll get deer out of them. After dark, we'll go in and get the deer out. I use them all the time. But to go hunting, really, really bad. Now, I have some guide. I have a guide one time in Buffalo County. is almost laughable. Is you got to know, like Buffalo County guides, and there might be some great ones out there, and I think great ones are. They're averaging 15, 20, 25% success, but they're not averaging 80% success. We go to a person, George, down at uh, Salt River Outfitters in Kentucky. I go down there with a HuntWise crew. I don't go to a lot of guides or outfitters. I go with them because it's kind of a work trip. Dylan and I shot 11 videos when we were down there last time, and they're a great group of people. They're like family to me. I work with them more than any other partner because I help develop HuntCast and RutCast it's my weather algorithm. That's my rut hunting formula. So I'm a big part of their company and I enjoy spending time with them. But George down there, he averages 70, 80% success. He's very good at what he does. But we get into most areas, Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, guides, outfitter, they're averaging a lot lower. So I had a guide tell me, that's how we shoot all our big bucks. We bring people out by ATV and drop them off. The difference with them, with that ATV and a guide or an outfitter, is their bar or their standards very low compared to mine. Now compared to, guy, to clients coming in, if they're averaging 25% success, 30%, 40% success, 20%, I wanna average 100% success. If I wanna use an ATV on a 30 acre parcel in Wisconsin that I hunt, 30 acres of cover, and I wanna use it, I saw what was there for 17 years, the neighbors that used an ATV to access, they pushed all the deer to our property. Now I hunt that same property. We don't use ATVs to access, and we've shot a lot of deer since 2014 on that land because we're not using ATVs. Again, my standard is very high. You know, for guiding and outfitting, 25% might be really good, 30% success rate, 20%. But I expect a lot higher, and I expect that times two, not just one. I'm not just going in for one buck, and we might have multiple hunters, so we're expecting three really good bucks on that property in one spot. So we're averaging a high, high percentage, over 100%. Um, in some cases, 200% for myself. I want to shoot, fill both my tags, my gun and my bow tag, um, when I'm hunting those lands. ATVs on your neighbor's land is a very good thing. People say, well, on my big parcel, you know, 600 acres in Iowa, I can access my stands with ATVs and they're not spoken deer. That's because you have 600 acres in Iowa, 65,000 bow hunters in Iowa at one time. It's probably 55 now. You know, Michigan was 425,000 bow hunters at one time. Wisconsin was in the high 300 range. Illinois was even 250 to 275,000. Minnesota, 250, 275,000, maybe in 300,000. We're not comparing apples to apples. You know, Kentucky had 200,000 hunters at one time, gun hunters and bow hunters combined. Michigan, you look at Michigan, I just use Michigan as a, I'll use Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania had 1.1 million rifle hunters at one time. Gun hunters going out in the woods. Michigan, two tags. You have gun tag or Wisconsin, two tags. You've had 800,000 gun hunters go into the woods, along with 300 and some thousand bow hunters. We're over a million hunters, a million tags go into the woods. So when you have a state that has a couple hundred thousand or 300,000, or, or it's you're not comparing apples to apples. So when, and you can pick XYZ state. And if you have a thousand acres, 2,000 acres, you know, God bless you. You earned it. I, I'm not going to, you know, if you have that, that's awesome. I feel privileged and blessed to have what I have. I feel privileged and blessed to have 30 acres that I can hunt in Wisconsin that I don't even own. You can make it happen. But if you're using ATVs, the minute you draw, you, and it used to be on, it was back in the uh, late eighties on Severance Road along the Cass River in your Cass City, Michigan, off M53 on the east side of it, south of Argyle Road. I just want to narrow it down for you guys. I'd hear the big red ATC, go down Severance Road, traveling to the east. They'd go by the cow pasture, that was about a 20 acre cow pasture. They'd go on the back side of the 80 acre woods. I can just picture them. Then they're going, and then they're crossing the river, getting into the really thick cover. And then within 10 minutes, I'm seeing up to 20, 30 deer come under my stand a half mile away because the ATV was going down the road and coming in that back side. Pretty soon they just start the key, go down the driveway. They're going down the road and those deer are coming. They didn't even get to the back side of the woods because the deer, just with that repetitive use and conditioning, those deer understand. And that's what happened fast forward to when the people that hunted our land and we were hunting the neighbor's land next to us, 
they would start their ATV at their house, travel down the road before they even got on the land, before they got to a quarter mile of the land, the deer were running off the land and falling right into our laps. They wouldn't even know it. They wouldn't even see it. The bottom line is they didn't shoot a lot of deer because of it. So ATV spook a lot of deer. Now I understand there's people that need to use an ATV to get to their spots. If you can use an electric golf cart, those are incredible. Very, very quiet. We use our quiet cats. We're blessed to use the quiet cats, electric bikes. We have about, say a three quarter mile drive tonight and we're out through fields. And going through that at 13, 14 miles an hour in the dark without a big headlight or something, is just whisper quiet going through there. I believe we can drive by most deer. And even then, what was it that actually went through the field at 13, 14 miles an hour in the dark without that stepping noise? So we're using quiet cats, electric golf carts, you have electric vehicles, those are all awesome. But when it comes to an ATV, if that's the only way you can hunt, you know, to get up to the top of your ridge, then more power to you. It's not even a thought then, just enjoy your hunt. But know the damage it does do um, hunting it be realistic about that and know that that's probably the number one way of spooking deer on your land and get this it's before you even step foot on the land so make sure you try to avoid spooking deer this year um, if you're my neighbors feel free to use ATVs they're your neighbors the same thing but bottom line is enjoy the hunt try to keep from spooking deer and you're gonna see a lot more deer and let's face it not everyone watches these videos not everyone listens or cares or believes me so those people are in high number, high percentage. If you're the quiet one in the area, if you're the one not spooking deer, you're gonna have a great hunt, not only this year, but every year beyond. And that's what I want for you. And that's why I have this channel. I just want you to be successful and have a great and safe hunt this fall. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.